Welcome back to Face the Nation. We return to our conversation with Texas Republican Congressman Tony Gonzalez, who joins us from San Antonio this morning. Congressman, I want to pick back up on border security. Um, migrant families after May 11th, um, if they cross into the U.S. illegally, will not be detained by the Biden administration. The Trump and Obama administrations did detain families. Should families be detained? There should be repercussions for people that enter the country illegally. And this is where the Biden administration is getting wrong. First off, they're doing more. And I appreciate the fact that they're trying different things. Uh, it's taken them a while, but I appreciate that. This is what they're getting wrong. They're putting all their time and effort into illegal immigration, finding ways to increase capacity, finding ways where people can come over illegally uh, quicker. Uh, the reality is nine out of 10 people that come over into our country illegally do not qualify for asylum. So stop sending them down that route when you know they're not going to qualify for asylum. I am of the mindset we need to encourage those to come over legally. You would I have to change the asylum visas. laws. Once again, though. I'm you That's do have to Congress. you do have to change the asylum laws and it's it's something that the president should work with Congress on. You haven't heard the president say one thing about immigration other than just blame others. Congress has a role to play. I think that uh, us passing this uh, bill in, in the House on security is important. The next step is immigration reform. I am committed yeah. to doing that. You haven't seen anyone even try immigration reform in the past decade. I think it's long time that we do something. In my yeah. opinion, that starts with protecting those that are doing it legally through work visas. So just to be clear, do you think it's humane to keep kids in detention centers with their parents? I, I think there needs to be a process where folks have their uh, asylum claim heard in days, not years. And if they yeah. qualify for asylum, welcome to the United States. And if they don't, you have to send them back to their country of origin. What, what we can't do is what we're having now. Right now, we have tens of thousands of children that are just being released into this country. What is happening to these children? Regardless of their legal, uh, legal identity, I mean, what is happening to this children, these children? So we have wow. to enforce the laws that are on the books, and we have to encourage those to come over legally yeah. and make it easier for folks to, to obtain work visas. Okay. Well, Health and Human Services takes those kids, um, custody of them, but, but point taken on um, needing to watch what happens next. Uh, Congressman, thank you very much for your time today. We want to turn now to Gary Cohn, who is the vice chairman of IBM, former Goldman Sachs president and uh, former Trump administration top economic advisor. Good morning to you. Lots of titles, Gary. Lots of experience. That's why we like having you here. Um, I want to ask you about what's happening with First Republic. Um, it's been under pressure. We know they've been looking for a buyer. Mm -hmm. uh, the FDIC, the government, is looking to arrange moving it into government control and then maybe selling it. What are you hearing about how this would roll out? Margaret, thanks for having me. I, I think you're portraying the situation as we find ourselves again on a weekend. Um, as we closed business Friday, the FDIC was in a process of looking for acquirers or bidders for the assets. Over the course of the weekend, I think the FDIC has asked potentially three banks for their final bids for the entire bank. The FDIC would prefer to sell the bank in its entirety than the pieces. Mm -hmm. What will most likely happen is the FDIC will seize control and then simultaneously resell the asset to the successful bidder. I think that will happen sometime later this afternoon before the markets open um, in Asia this evening. And this will be a faster process than what happened with SVB? It will be, it will be a much faster process. Now, we've been going down this process for the last two weeks or so yeah. as First Republic continues to be under pressure and continues to lose deposits. Unfortunately, First Republic reported this week that they had a massive outflow of deposits over the last quarter. So if um, First Republic is sold, then the acquirer would take on the deposits. Yes. So. Um, what do you think about the conversation we had earlier with Congressman Khanna about whether Congress needs to do something here? Because it seems like we're just going into emergency yeah. mode now for three banks. Yeah. Does there need to be a, a broader change to the regulatory system and to the laws? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. So, look, I, I don't agree with Congressman Kohana that we want unlimited FDIC insurance. I think that, to me, is a bit of a race to the bottom. You had picked like two, two million, five million, ten million. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be some limit. At some point, you have to limit because you don't want a total race to the bottom where, you know, the, the weakest bank with the weakest balance sheet in the world can offer you the highest rate of return on your deposits. 
and therefore you take your deposits there because guess what? They're insured by the federal government. That's right. not what we want to see. We want to see some type of discipline in the system. When you talk about more and more regulation, I smiled because if you look at the report that came out that you referenced with, with uh, Rokohana as well, you know, one of the findings in the report is that the regulators did not do a very good job enforcing the existing rules. Mm -hmm. So if you can't enforce the rules you already have on the books, and, and by it's hard to enforce the rules because there are so many rules, do you want to create more and more rules when you can't enforce the ones you already have? Part of me feels like we need to get a simpler, more coherent set of rules so the bank regulators can actually enforce them and they know what the important rules are. But the bank regulators here are at the Fed. That's what we're talking about. They're at the Fed and at the states. Remember, we have yes, state regulated sta banks true. and federally regulated banks. Well, then that's a big conversation for California since they just had two banks it is. Uh, have some big problems. But Fed Chairman Powell is going to face questions from the press midweek. Yes. Um, they, he gives a press conference around the decision on interest rates that he is expected to be making. Um, do you think these banking problems are going to interfere with his plan? I do don't think these problems are going to interfere with his plans. I actually think they're helpful to his plans. Because so, they're slowing the economy? Exactly. What, what, the, what the, the chair has been trying to do is slow the economy down. He's been trying to tamp down inflation. Inflation is too many goods chasing too few products. And part of the, 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 the chasing has been the easy availability of credit. Now that we've seen deposits lose the system, leave the system and we've seen banks in tighter financial position, they are not offering loans as easily as they were before and the loans have become more expensive. So people are borrowing less money, they have less access to credit, so their ability to purchase is going down. Purchasing power is waning in the United States, which is exactly what the chairman's been trying to do by raising interest rates. So he's in, there, in, in essence getting enormous amount of help out of this banking crisis. Not what he wanted to see happen in any way, shape or form, but the unintended consequence is very helpful to slowing down the economy and tamping down inflation. So does it up the odds of a recession being more than mild? Uh, it probably ups the odds, yes. I mean, it definitely ups the odds. It takes control out of the Fed. The Fed is no longer in, in total control of slowing down the economy. They've now got the banking industry playing along with them. But as we've seen in the economic data recently, the consumer in the United States still is in relatively good shape. They are starting to run out of savings. The money that they got during COVID, we, we put an enormous amount of stimulus into consumers' bank accounts. Um, and both that, administrations. Bo Trump both administrations. And every, every administration put an uh, enormous amount of stimulus into the bank accounts. We see from the savings data that's starting to, to wear down, starting to, to run off. So as that runs off further and further, the economy would become more credit dependent to keep thriving. So I think we will see a slowdown. And I still think we're in a relatively decent shape. We may have a recession, but I still think we could muddle through the bottom here without a, a, a real deep recession. Um, the chair of the House Financial Services Committee, uh, Congressman McHenry, called the Fed's report a self-serving justification of Democrats' long-held priorities. Um, he may be venting. It doesn't look like Congress is doing anything uh, to change regulation or laws related to banking. Um, there was a FDIC report on the collapse of Signature Bank, which blamed bad management, but it also said regulators just didn't have enough staff in New York. I mean, this, there's some pretty damaging bits of information in here. If you put aside the politics, the regulators don't have enough staff. They didn't act. So who are they being held accountable by unless it's Chair Powell? Well, I, it, it is Chair Powell. And I think, I think when the chairman goes to Congress, and remember, he testifies in front of both the House and the Senate a couple times a year, historically, all of the questions have been on monetary policy. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more questions on the, regula on the regulatory policy. How is regulation working? Are they keeping up to what they need to do? Do they have proper staff? Are there issues that are going by that are not being covered? This is a, a huge finding. I mean, this is a, a bit of a seismic moment because we believe in the United States, and I think the U.S. population believes that the banks where they deposit their hard-earned money are well-regulated. Right. And we have found out this week in the Fed's own report that these banks are not well regulated and, the, and they admitted it themselves. I ran a regulated bank. I know that if we would have ever told our regulator that we did not have a, 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 enough people to regulate ourselves, they yeah. would have shut us down. Right. So we cannot wow. be in a position where the regulators themselves say we do not have enough staff to regulate you properly. You ran one of the biggest banks. Uh, Gary, we got to leave it there. We'll be back in a moment. 
A search is underway in Texas for a gunman who allegedly killed five of his next door neighbors, including an eight year old on Friday. Sheriff's deputies say the suspect entered the neighbor's house firing his AR-15 execution style after they asked him to stop firing the gun in his yard while their baby slept. Thursday, we spoke with some parents about the impact of gun violence on their children, and we began with a mother who says her biggest concern about raising her young daughter is her safety. We never had things like lockdown drills or anything like that in school. Having her come home when she was even in kindergarten and first grade telling me about this is something that is a little bit concerning to me. What was that conversation like? How did you talk to her about gun violence? Well, um, I live in a home where my husband does have firearms and we've learned to use them like respectfully and there's a lot of rules and regulations around the safe use of guns. She didn't really seem very scared about it. She said that, you know, the teachers did a very good job of it. Um, what was concerning to me is just like at such a young age that they're learning that this could happen. I know, uh, Scott, you are in Ohio and um, Wayne, you are in Arkansas. I imagine um, you are familiar with guns yourselves in your communities. Uh, yes, and, and also uh, lockdown drills. Um, my wife is an early uh, childhood intervention specialist and has been for decades. And uh, I've been a substitute teacher. Luckily, we have not had any shooters in those, but we've had to talk to our kids and we've had to, uh, they've had to live through us notifying them that we were locked down in a school and them notifying us that they were locked down in schools. Does that cause your children to worry? They've seen us make it through it. And they have understood what the lockdowns were about. Uh, often they were um, uh, in my wife's neighborhood. It, uh, somebody was shot a couple blocks away, but that's enough to lock down the school. I think they understand, you know, that there is a risk, but that risk is spread out across the United States. And and even even with the awful amount that's happening, the chances of them happening at their very school on that day, um, they have bigger worries. Wayne, how much concern does gun violence cause uh, for your children, particularly in school? With me being ex-military, I'm a veteran, they come to me telling me we want to learn. My biggest concern is I have an elementary school here that when everybody's inside, it turns into a prison. All the gates are locked, all the windows are locked. And I'm kind of concerned about that because if it gets past the front door, they can't get out. Uh, Scott, uh, I know in your state there was recently a law passed to make it easier for public school teachers to carry guns. Do you think that makes schools more secure? No, I, I think that it does quite the opposite. Uh, again, um, a school shooter is not a common experience. You bring in uh, guns into classrooms, then you have millions of guns across the nation in classrooms five days a week. You have all sorts of opportunities to, to create a, um, a gun disaster. Mm -hmm. and which you wouldn't have had before they did this. Show of hands, do all of you believe that mental health is an issue right now and primarily to blame for the gun violence that we've been seeing? Raise your hand if you think that's true. All of you think mental health. I do think it's a contributing factor though, especially when you see some of the school shootings with some of the younger individuals, yeah. I feel like we're not doing enough to stop it from happening. Okay, so how many of you, show of hands, think uh, gun laws should be more strict in your state? Scott, you're the only one who wants your state of Ohio to have stricter gun laws. Okay. Um, how many of you think the federal government can do more to make life safer for kids when it comes to gun violence? Scott, again, you're the only one. Christine, why don't you think that the government can do more? A lot of people think of um, restricting, causing more laws. And like, the truth of it is, is that the criminals don't listen to the laws. If they did, they wouldn't be criminals. And Wayne, when it comes to mental health, you also don't think there's something that the state or federal government could do 
as it relates to the link between mental health and gun violence? I think the laws that are already on the books need a little bit more human involvement. We need to have more people that look at what who's picking up this gun and what they're going to do with it. How many of you are optimistic about the country right now? Raise your hand if you're optimistic. Wayne and Scott, Christine? No? I mean, the economy's not great. Some of the relationships with foreign countries are not as good as they used to be. I mean, it's just, it, yeah, I do think like drugs are a big deal to me. The bullying is a big deal. I don't know. I just, I do think there's a lot of issues. I'm a born again Christian. I have a very tight understanding of what that means. I am seeing this country at this moment. Mm -hmm. In 10 years, it's going to be about the same. They're making it seem like there's something going on that's pulling our economy down. And if we keep thinking that, we will go down. If we change our mindset, if you can shake it off, the sun comes up, you keep going. Scott, what are you optimistic about? I'm. Um, it also is related to um, uh, my church experience. Um, I see a lot of people connecting uh, and still connecting. Uh, you know, I, you see on the media um, how everything is going down and uh, is just on the edge of falling off a cliff. I think we can pull together and move, move ahead. We've got to pull together. Because if we don't, we will go down. The, we will go down that rabbit hole. I like, I like your sentiment that we all need to pull together. I think that's a good note for us to end on today. We'll be right back. Russian forces fired dozens of missiles and drones in Ukraine, the heaviest barrage in weeks. Just as Kiev says, preparations are underway for a major spring counteroffensive. Our Charlie Daggett has the latest from Dnipro. A fuel storage depot erupted into an inferno on the Russian-occupied peninsula of Crimea. Russia blamed a drone strike. A Ukrainian official would only call it God's punishment for the heaviest bombardment this country has seen in weeks. Almost two dozen civilians killed in the central city of Uman, including small children. We found residents digging out after a missile strike outside Dnipro that killed 31-year-old Olga and her two-year-old daughter, Veronica. Her uncle Sergei told us she was very funny, very clever. We had big hopes for her. There are no military targets here, and it's nowhere near the front line. Where trench warfare rages on, especially in and around the contested city of Bakhmut. A front line that might be about to expand dramatically as Ukraine's defense minister announced that the counteroffensive is about ready for launch. His words, just waiting for God's will in the weather. NATO announcing that 98% of the promised combat vehicles have been delivered, among them 230 tanks. But there are serious concerns, part of those leaked intelligence documents, over Ukraine's rapidly dwindling air defense systems, a question we put to senior defense official Alexei Danilov. What can you tell us about that? I can tell you that we are constantly working on this issue, he said. We are in great need of aircraft. We need a new means of anti-air defense if we want to be successful in this war. Analysts say if Russian fighter jets and bombers are able to operate freely over the skies in Ukraine, it could drastically change the course of the war. It's impossible to overestimate the importance of air defense systems in safeguarding cities like here in Dnipro and the capital, Kyiv, where defense officials say 11 missiles and two drones were intercepted in the latest wave of attacks. Margaret? Charlie Daggett, thank you. The struggle for democracy and freedom of the press were the main focus of last night's annual White House Correspondents' Dinner in a Washington ballroom packed with journalists, politicians, and celebrities. 
The president did get some laughs as he made fun of his age and when he took some swipes at Republicans and conservative-leaning media outlets. But his tone was sober when he called for the release of wrongfully detained journalist Evan Gorskovich of The Wall Street Journal, currently imprisoned in Russia, and Austin Tice, who's been held in Syria for 11 years. Journalism is not a crime. Evan and Austin should be released immediately, along with every other American held hostage or wrongfully detained abroad. Paul Whelan, unjustly held in Russia for more than four years. They are not forgotten. And I promise you, I am working like hell to get them home. My commitment is to bring them home. Just as I know your commitment is to continue to be in a free and fearless press. And that's what we honor tonight. You make it possible for ordinary citizens to question authority. The free press is a pillar, maybe the pillar, of a free society, not the enemy. The president's remarks are usually the highlight of the event, but last night, there was one guest in attendance who stole the show. We'll never give up on hope. Things can get better. Things can turn. Things can change. Tonight, unlike last year, Brittany Griner's here with her wife, Cheryl. <laughs> Brittany, where are you, kid? Stand up. Come on. I love this woman. It's great to have you home. And boys, I can hardly wait to see you back on the court, kid. Greiner is now using her public platform to advocate for Americans who are wrongfully detained, including the family of Ahmad Shargi and others held for years in Iran. We'll be right back. This programming note, our CBS News streaming daily political broadcast, Red and Blue, is going to get a new name and a new look. America Decides premieres tomorrow and airs starting Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern with second runs at 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern. As for us, until next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.